night's beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. But tonight's story began when one man tried to destroy another with the strangest weapon of all, darkness. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. When your job is to walk into the darkness and discover what makes a city tick, you pick up some mighty strange friends. The winos dreaming of a muscatel paradise in cold, dark doorways. The petty larceny boys with their fast deals. The painted little dames defying the world with their brassy laughter. The homeless, the hopeless. In the city, night is for the lost. And sometimes you feel a hunger to be with someone of the everyday world. Some nice, well-adjusted soul who's got a reason for waking up tomorrow morning. I guess that's why I dropped in to see Bessie Chatfield tonight. Bessie's a little gray-haired librarian who has charge of a small storefront library on Huron Street. No one around this time of night but Bessie and a young fellow in a gray raincoat alone at a reading table. Mr. Stone, well, we haven't seen you, oh, in such a long time. <laughs> well, since Forever Amber, you haven't had the kind of high-type literature that interests me. <laughs> and when you finally do drop in, look what time we get here. Ten o'clock. Right when I have to go over and start turning out the light. I, uh, I timed it that way so I could get you behind those bookcases, uh, away from that fellow with the reading desk. Well, I'm afraid your timing is about 35 years off, Mr. Stone. <laughs> Oh, these light switches. Why do they always put them up so high? Aren't you going to tell that fellow it's time to go home? This is the way we tell them. We flick off the lights and then flick them on again. First off, like this. No! Don't do that! No! What? Turn the lights on quick. Let me handle him. What's the idea of doing that, mister? That's supposed to be smarter, so... Oh, take it easy, fella. Take it easy. Or did he pay you to do it? Is that the deal? Huh? You tell George Brewster that the game doesn't amuse me anymore. You tell him if he keeps that up, I'll... I'll kill him. Oh, wait. I turned the lights out. It's closing time. What? Closing time? Oh. Yes, of course. What's wrong with you, buddy? You sick or something? Sick. Sick, yes. That's me. Sick. Only mine's a childhood disease. Childhood. Childhood disease. Now, what in the world was that? I don't know. Ever seen him before? He's come in a couple of times this week. Spent all his time reading some reference books at the table. Seemed to be such a nice, polite young man. Considerate, kindly. Let's take a look at those books. Oh, my heavens, my, my heart is beating a mile a minute. And did you see his face? It frightened me. He was even more scared than we were. Of what? These are the books he was reading? Yes. The Mind in Limbo, Abnormal Psychology, Modern Psychiatry. Why would he want books like this? Maybe he was looking for somebody in these books. Who? Himself, Bessie. Probably himself. (laughs) Bessie was pretty upset, so after she locked up for the night, I started walking her toward the elevated station over on Lake Street. We walked a couple of blocks through the dark, empty streets when suddenly Bessie grabbed my arm. Mr. Stone, that man down the street, looking in that store window, mm? that's him. Oh, yes, same gray raincoat, same lad. And look, Mr. Stone, what's that in his hand? That's a piece of pipe or something. He's breaking that store window. Yeah, you wait right here, honey. Be careful, Mr. Stone, be careful. The fellow was reaching through the broken window glass for whatever it was that had struck his fancy. He heard me coming and turned toward me. The wan street light did something to his face. It seemed twisted and torn. Blood was running down his hand where the glass had cut him. Then I saw what he'd taken from the window. A gun. What's the idea, pal? He spun around and started running for the elevator station down the block. And in the best tradition of the Rover boys, I stayed right on his tail. He turned back to see how I was doing. He stumbled over a trash can. 
I caught up with him, grabbing his arm. Go on, me. Leave me alone. Uh-uh. Let go of me. <laughs> he slashed the gun across my face and began running again. I stopped long enough to take a quick inventory of my teeth. Up above, I heard the elevator train coming into the station. The young fellow had reached the station steps and was going up fast, trying to make that train. I reached for one of his legs. He turned and gave it to me right in the stomach. Oh. I folded up, and I just sat there. I listened to the train pull away with the fellow on it, and remembered what Bessie had said about him being such a nice, polite young man. After a while, I began to feel somewhat human again. I notified the police what had happened, and they set a squad car out. After they left, I remembered something. A name this nice, polite young man had been throwing around. George Brewster. I found a phone book in a cigar store. There were three George Brewsters. The first number didn't answer. I tried the second. Hello? I'd like to speak to George Brewster. Who is that in right now? Is there any message? Uh, who is this? I'm assist. Is anything wrong? Well, if this is the right George Brewster, something is wrong. Is there any reason why a young fellow should want to kill your brother? Oh, oh, that would be Morrison. Oh, I warned George. Morrison, huh? Tom Morrison. Well, where does he live? Our old apartment, 612 Hamlin Avenue. What makes you think he wants to kill George? Well, this uh, character broke into a store tonight and stole a gun. I sort of think he had your brother in mind when he did it. Oh, no. What am I going to do? Well, lady, I know what I'm going to do. As fast as I hang up and get another nickel into this phone, I'm going to call the police. Oh, not really Morrison's fault, poor man. Oh, no, no. He's, uh, he's just a prince of a fellow. Uh, goodbye, lady. I've got to make a call. But then it turned out that I didn't have a nickel. And on the way to the counter for change, I started wondering why the sister of the man he was going to kill felt sorry for Morris. And why Bessie thought he was such a sweet character. And, well, the night was young, and 612 Hamlin Avenue couldn't wait, and I could call the cops later. <laughs> 612 North Hamlin was a second-floor flat on the north side. I got there a few minutes after 11 that night. All the windows were lit up. I rang the bell, and I waited. I felt a little bead of sweat zigzagging down my face like it didn't have any place to go. Yes? It's you. No, no, let's not close the door just yet. In fact, let's push it open all the way. What do you want? My two front teeth and a few ribs. Get out of here. Now, look, pal, don't tempt me. I came against my better judgment to listen to what you've got to say. If I leave now, the only place I'm going is the nearest police station. Police station. I guess maybe that would be the best. What? Otherwise, I don't know what's going to happen. I guess you better call the police, mister. What do you think you're doing, calling my bluff? The phone's right behind you. Okay, buddy, you asked for it. Sure this is the way you want it? It's better this way. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't want to kill him. George Brewster? Yes, George Brewster. I know how it'll end if he doesn't stop. Stop what? Call the police, mister. You'd be doing me a favor. Since when have I got to do you favors? Well, why aren't you calling I'm an Eagle Scout in good standing. I haven't done my good deed for today. You can't help me, mister. Stone is the name. What makes you so sure I can? Thanks for even wanting to. After that bad time I gave you. Bad time? That's the understatement of the year. Well, I was panic-stricken. He got me half crazy. Well, what have you got to lose if you tell me about it? No. Okay. Wait, wait. I don't know. I'm like a drowning man grasping at straws. Look... Maybe if you talked to Brewster, told him what he's doing to me, maybe, maybe he'd leave me alone. <laughs> well, you never can tell. But I'd have to know what I'm talking about. It's quite a story, mister. These lights. Look at them. Bright as the sun, aren't they? Lamps. Overhead chandeliers. Look at them. I'd hate to see your light bills. Like some men need drugs. That's how I need these lights. Come again. My sanity depends on it. My very sanity. On these lights? It's a sickness. You've even got a name for it. Noctophobia, it's called. Fear of darkness. Fear of darkness? That's for kids. I... Uh, no, I, I uh, take that back. I'm sorry. Don't be. 
I quite agree. Kids are neurotic women. But in a man of my age, it's, it's quite ridiculous. And when the day starts drawing to a close, when the night starts crowding in. Have you been to a doctor? Sure, I've been to a doctor. They tell me I shouldn't feel too badly. Plenty of people with my trouble. A hangover from childhood. An illness. Like heart trouble is an illness. I'll take the heart trouble. Maybe you haven't gone to the right kind of a doctor. Maybe psychiatry could help you. Nothing's going to help me. George Brewster's going to see to that. What about this, uh, Brewster? He's trying to destroy me. With the strangest weapon of all. The strangest weapon of all? Yes. His weapon is the night. You are listening to Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy. In a moment, we'll return to Night Beat and Randy Stone. But first, we'd like to call your attention to another great NBC mystery adventure program. Every Sunday, you'll want to hear the exciting new Christopher London series with screen actor Glenn Ford in the title role. Stories for Christopher London are furnished by Earl Stanley Gardner, one of the most famous mystery story writers in America. There is no doubt about the greatness of Gardner's stories, and with the superb acting of Glenn Ford, Christopher London should be must-listening for every mystery fan. Make a listening date now to hear the exciting adventures of Christopher London every Sunday over most of these same NBC stations. And now, back to Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone in Night Beat. It was a weird feeling standing in Morrison's brilliantly lighted parlor listening to him tell me about his terror of darkness. A sturdy, healthy-looking man trapped by a childhood nightmare. I felt guilt listening to him like I was eavesdropping into a dark corner of his mind that was nobody's business but his own. And yet he had to tell me because he needed help. Because George Brewster was using Morrison's fear to destroy him. I was sent to Chicago by our company to replace Brewster Stone. Until he found out why I was here, he couldn't do enough for me. He even got me this apartment. Greater love has no man. Then he found out what the setup was. He changed fast enough. How did he find out about this uh, fear of yours? Well, I'm telling you how. The other night, the two of us were working alone in the big vault down at the office, working on some old car, rather. The overhead light it blew out. Uh-huh. Well, it was so sudden, I, I couldn't help myself. I tried to keep calm, but... It looked like something tearing me to pieces inside. I, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't... Finally, I had to run. So he found out... No, about... no, no, he wasn't sure, but he started him thinking. Yes, I see. Next afternoon, he came over to my desk. He was jovial, friendly, like he'd been in the beginning. Saying we'd been at each other's throats long enough. Inviting me to have dinner with him that night. Right from work, we went to his favorite spot on the north side, a place called the Catacombs. I began feeling uneasy the moment I entered. How do you like this place, Tom? That's okay. It's fine. Uh, it's been a favorite of mine for years. One spot in particular. <laughs> the wine cellar. How do you feel about wine? Oh, I like it all right. Come along with me. I'm a wine man from way back. Uh, say, George, I... I wanted to talk to you about that little outburst last night. They have a different wine cellar here with a different temperature for each type of wine. I haven't been sleeping well, you see. Me, I prefer a Riesling myself. Well, here we are. Huh? At the white wine cellar. We'll select our own brand for our supper. Here, I'll open the door. Yeah, this is a privilege only an old customer like me can get away with. Come on. It's dark down there. That's why they've got this candle here on the ledge. Got a match? I, uh... A match, Tom. Mm. Yeah. Here. Okay. I'll get this candle going. Good. Now, let's go downstairs. Uh, George, uh... You think we should do this on our own? Done it hundreds of times. Been coming here for the last ten years. Well, now, let's go down these stairs. Then. Careful, Nina. Yeah. George, I was explaining about last night. Candle casts uh, funny shadows, doesn't it? 
You notice how cool it is? 20 feet below street level. Here. Look, I want to talk about last night. I, I don't want any misunderstanding. Huh? It's just that I've been working pretty hard. Look, Tom. Would it make you feel better if you showed me you're not afraid of the dark? Okay, you can show me. I'll blow out the candle. What are you trying to prove, Brewster? Nothing at all. That's your idea. Where are those matches I gave you? You gave me some matches? Well, I must have lost them. It's not going to work, Brewster. I'm not insane, you know. I can stay down here until you're quite satisfied. Funny, isn't it? About the darkness. The way it seems to close in on you. The way you start thinking you can't read. I know, I, I can see how someone could... What's the matter, Tom? This is ridiculous. Something so suffocating about a dark room. Stop it. Stop it. Only the heavy, smothering blackness. Stop it. Where are you going, Tom? Anything wrong? <laughs> Anything wrong? Anything wrong? I ran out of that cellar like a kid. Like a kid scared to death, Stone. That was a rotten thing for him to do. Well, he's fighting for his job, Stone. He's not too young anymore. He can't start all over again, so he'll do anything. Oh, great. I'm sure he's told the people down at work. I'm sure they're all laughing at me behind my back. You don't know what that does to me. I can imagine. Today I found a new desk lamp on my desk, courtesy of George Brewster. Every day, something like that. Did you ask him why he's doing it? He won't admit he's doing anything, since it's all my imagination. Maybe I ought to see a doctor. Or better still, maybe a change of climate would help. Well, I'd leave town in a minute. I mean, my future's at stake, too. Before I let him drive me crazy, I'll kill him. Well, I'm going now. I'm going to talk to this bird. Where does he live? Out in the suburbs, Lake Forest. He lives with his sister. All right, I'll give you a ring as soon as I've seen him. Mrs. Stone, I... Hope you can do some good. Yeah. Oh. Say, I almost forgot something. What? Now, that gun you made off with. Well, I... Maybe uh, if we're lucky, we can talk the store owner out of pressing charges. I'll try it. That was a crazy thing to do. I was so desperate. Wouldn't have done you much good when they put them in the window. They never loaded. I'll let you in on a secret. If I hadn't known that, I wouldn't have been such a hero coming here tonight. I'll let you in on a secret, Mr. Stone. You can get bullets without a license. The gun's loaded now. Oh, oh, oh great. All right, go, go and get it for me. All right. Yes, I want to give it to you. It's in my bedroom. He started for the bedroom. And then it was almost like a comedy routine where after the big build-up, the punchline comes right out on cue. The moment he entered the other room, every light in the house suddenly went out. What happened to the lights? Take it easy. Oh, where's the fuse box? I don't know. Never had any occasion to use it. Besides, if it was a fuse, all the lights wouldn't go out. It wasn't you. Use your head. How could I do it? I'm getting out of here. All lights out, too. Stone. Well, I... maybe something went wrong with the central wire. But why should it happen exactly now? Wait, huh? The downstairs apartment. Their lights are on. If it was the wire, all right, I'd... All right, let's ask them where the fuse box is. Oh, Mr. Morris. Uh, my lights went out. It, it might be a fuse. Where are the fuse boxes for these apartments? Out in the back. I'll get a flashlight and show you. Here we are. The fuse box is right here below our meters. Whenever the people from the light company come out, they have a dickens of a time finding it. Can you hold the flashlight steady and let me take a look? Wait a minute, Stone. Lower the flashlight just a little. Huh? It's not the fuse. Look at the master switch on my meter. Look at the one of Mrs. Graham's. Why, somebody pulled your switch down to off. Yes. Yes, someone surely did. Well, here, let me push it up. There. And look upstairs. All your lights are on again. That's probably some kids playing a joke. How do you suppose the rascals ever found it? It's so well hidden. I, uh, I've got a theory that all kids come equipped with a special radar for finding things like this. Mrs. Graham, tell this gentleman who used to live in my apartment before I did. Why? Tell him. Why, you know. He even got the apartment for you. Your friend, Mr. Brewster. But what is that? Tom, that doesn't prove he did it. 
For me, it does, Stone. For me, it does. <laughs> Morrison went around to the front of his house and up the stairs to his flat. I waited in the hallway until he came down again. He looked different. His face was hard and set. His eyes were like chunks of glass punched into the flesh. What are you waiting for, Stone? When we were so rudely interrupted, you were going for the gun. I've got it now. Ah, oh, yes. Hand it over. I'll bring it back. No, thanks. Now, where are you going and what are you going to do? I'm fighting for my sanity, my life. He's never going to do this to me again. Never. I can't let you do that. I'm not going to have to. The minute you leave, I'm going to call every cop in the book. Yes, that's what you do, isn't it? Yes. And I'd better give you the gun. <laughs> this could become habit forming. I dropped to my knees in the hallway, and then the hallway subdivided like something under a microscope, and there were two hallways, and then there were four. And then everywhere I looked, there were hallways. Morrison tried to push me aside and get by me, only it was a whole circle of Morrison's. I grabbed at his legs to hold him back and was like grabbing at a centipede. Then all the Morrison's in all the hallways brought all their guns down on my one poor head. And that was it, brothers and sisters, that was it. Feeling better, Mr. Stone? Oh, if I felt any better, I'd call in a barber. Oh, what a business. I heard a commotion and I came out and you were lying here. Oh, is this my head or is it a candle? Oh, how hmm. did it happen and where's Mr. Morrison? Oh, Morrison, Morrison, yes. How long ago did you hear this commotion? Oh, just a couple of minutes ago. You came out of it real fast. Yeah, I've got an iron constitution. Have you got a, got a phone? Well, yes, but don't you think you Come better... on, lady, grab my head, put it back on nice and neat, and let's get to that phone. <laughs> Hello, this is the fellow who called you before, Miss Brewster, about Morrison and your brother. Oh, yes. He's not there yet, huh? No, my brother is... I don't mean your brother, I mean Morrison. What? No, is, is he... Oh, yes, he sure is. Now, give me your address, and the minute you hang up, get away from your house as fast as you can. Morrison's got a gun, and he's half crazy. Maybe we should call the police. Well, maybe we should, but I'm not going to. They'd throw the book at him ten years for attempted murder. I think I can stop him before he does anything. Oh, I can't tell you how sorry I am about this. Lady, you and your brother should be. <laughs> The cab got me out to their Lake Forest house in less than 20 minutes. The house was on a hill, and a flagstone path wound round and round for a city block until it reached the front porch. As I ran up the walk, my head started rattling like a handful of pennies in a tin cup. I felt weak and tired. All the time, I tried not to think about what I'd find when I reached the house. And now I was at the end of the path, walking toward the front porch. A nerve deep in my throat started jangling like a burglar alarm. The house was in darkness. And Morrison was standing beneath a little porch light, his gun pointed right at me. You won't quit, will you, Stone? What have you done with him, Tom? He hasn't done anything with him yet, Mr. Stone. Huh? Who is... I'm sitting over here at the end of the porch. I'm George's sister. Oh. I didn't see you in the dark. Why didn't you get away like I told you? I won't hurt her. It's him. He'll be coming along soon. George, you'd never have done anything. I beg you not to. Take advantage of a man's weakness. Well, Mr. Brewster is coming home. What? Huh? His car is stopping at the bottom of the hill. Now he's starting a long climb. Morrison, listen to me. You just sit there, the both of you. And I must insist that you be very quiet. Please, listen to me. Please. Please. Keep coming up that path, Brewster. It's a long, long way. You must listen to me. Morrison. You don't know what you're waiting doing. Waiting near the porch light, the gun George in his hurt hand. You. You shouldn't have done that. Far below the small what figure of George here? Brewster don't making a long, slow climb. You're going to kill George because he found out about you here. But don't you see? George is afraid, too. A bigger thing. Of being 53 and seeing his whole life going down. Brewster had stopped at the first landing to That's catch his breath. Now he was climbing up the path again. He was fighting. Maybe a hundred steps from his death. I found myself counting the steps. Why are you afraid of Don't you see? If you 
weren't afraid George couldn't hurt you anymore. Please, listen to me. Keep your voice down. If you try to warn him, you both die, too. Keep coming, Brewster. Yes, he kept coming. No more than 70 steps now. What is there to fear about the dog? The girl's voice going on and on. Nothing. Brewster getting closer. All it does is hide the world. Less than 50 steps now. 40 steps. 30 steps. If you believe in God, if you believe in your own soul, how can you fear the night? What is there in the darkness that can hurt you? There's such peace in the darkness. After the heat of day is gone, the rush, the tumult, the struggle, you can breathe easy again. You can let the tightness inside unwind. It's almost closer. Listen to me. Please, listen. It's not going to work, Miss Brewster. I'm going to try and work. Wait. Miss Brewster. Stay where you are, Miss Brewster. No. You must see me in the light. I tell you, stay with Tom. Look at her. I didn't realize. I'm not afraid. What right have you to fear? Julie, is that you on the porch? What right? Have you to fear, Mr. Martin? What right? You, oh, what a long time. Must be getting old. Well, what are you doing here, Morrison? And who's this? I uh, don't uh, mind me. I just came along for the ride. What's this all about? I... I just came to... to say goodbye, Brewster. You're leaving? Yes. I'm going back and tell them you've... you've done a good job here. It's not fair to replace you after so many years. You're sure nobody scared you away, Marson? Look at him, Brewster. Does he look like he's afraid? I don't know if Julie cured Morrison of his fear of darkness. Cure is a pretty strong word. But maybe she helped. I kind of think so. I do know this... It's going to be mighty hard for Tom to fear the darkness, knowing Julie is not afraid. But neither Tom nor I will ever forget what we saw as the porch light lit up her face. Julie Brewster, who did not fear the darkness, was blind. And now that part of the story they always print in heavy type, the moral. And don't smile so indulgently. Morals are very nice things. Some of my best friends have morals. <laughs> you know, seriously, Julie's whole life is a moral in itself. And trying to top it is like trying to follow Al Jolson with a mammy song. The best you can do is tip your hat to the fellow who wrote... Out of the night that covers me, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. He must have had someone like Julie in mind. Well, four o'clock in the morning, a stale cup of coffee, a tired sandwich, and a story to dictate, and I worry about my unconquerable soul. Ah, me. Give me a rewrite. Night Beat, a new dramatic series, stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Night Beat is written by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music by Frank Worth. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. Stay tuned for Brian Donlevy and Dangerous Assignments on F.